My name is Peter Taylor. Um, I'm your host today um, in my capacity as director of the Australian Research Council's Council Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. That's ASEMS for short. And it's my absolute pleasure today to, in, to in, be able to introduce two speakers. The first is Louise Ryan. Louise is a chief investigator of ASEMS. She's an extremely distinguished professor of statistics. She spent most of her career at Harvard University in Boston, where she started as a PhD student, and she returned in 2009 to CSIRO, um, and then in 2012 she moved to the University of Technology, Sydney, as a distinguished professor of statistics. She's well known for methodolo methodological con contributions to, to statistical methods in medical and environmental health research. She's uh, authored and co-authored more than 300 peer review publications, and she's been recognized with several prestigious awards and honors. And in particular, Louise loves being part of interdisciplinary research, and I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. Louise's colleague on the um, seminar is Dr. Stephanie Clark, who's a water resources engineer uh, with an MSc in applied mathematics and a PhD in statistics. So I think Stephanie covers the cross-disciplinary nature of things all in one person. Um, she's uh, got a focus on improving the extraction of meaningful messages out of a vast amount of water related data that's currently being collected. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney, and her research focuses in the area of applied statistics and improving the application machine learning techniques in fields in the fields of hydrology and water resources. And just before I start um, the seminar officially and hand over to Louise and Stephanie, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, on which I live and work, which is in Melbourne, and the, the, the owners of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and they've been custodians of the land for thousands of years, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And indeed, I pay my respects to the elders past and present of all the Indigenous people who own the land on which any of us are, are, are sitting on at the moment. And I know there's uh, people from around the country of Australia, and, and so therefore there will be lots of different traditional owners. And I'd like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal elders of other communities and anyone who's online today. So Louise, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Peter. Stephanie and I really appreciate the opportunity to present this public lecture for ASEMS today. I'd like to thank Rob Heineman and Mitchell O'Hara Wild from Monash University, also Dan Pagendam from the CSIRO for their contributions to the project. So we all know that water is a precious resource and increasingly so these days. According to Geoscience Australia, ours is the driest continent besides Antarctica in terms of average annual rainfall. And in fact, many parts of Australia rely on access to groundwater aquifers for drinking water and irrigation purposes and so on. In Western Australia, for example, it's estimated that about 50% of their water consumption comes from groundwater. So for these reasons, it's really important that state and federal governments do a good job in regulating access to those aquifers. So water extraction licenses are valuable, they're tradable, and they're often quite contentious and they often come up in the news. It's really important that we have good monitoring systems in place to help us manage and protect the water resources and in particular to ensure their sustainability into the future. What's particularly important is that there's good quality data and good quality modeling that allows us to do those projections. So groundwater modeling, there's a long history on this. And the classic approach based, is based on mathematical physics ideas related to theories about how liquids flow through porous media. And these kinds of models, they build on some data, but also lots of scientific knowledge and assumptions about what is the shape and the nature of the underground structures. And you can see this diagram over in the bottom right hand corner where you can see uh, above the surface you've got you know plants and, and rivers and so on but then underneath that there are different kinds of aquifers the one on the bottom is a confined aquifer where you've got a uh, non-permeable rock above and below it the one above that the unconfined aquifer 
you, you've got a direct connection to the surface and so rain or river sources can soak in and replenish that unconfined aquifer. But to know what is going on under the surface so that you can start to do some modeling, you need to have some knowledge. This might come from drilled bore sample cores that are extracted when uh, water bores or extraction bores are being put in place, or maybe in its, it might be in an area where there's a lot of mining and so they'll look at drilled cores, which can help them to start to reconstruct what might be going on beneath the surface. But as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of uncertainty about it. You also need assumptions about what the rainfall is like. You can obviously measure the rainfall, but you need assumptions about where the rain is, which rainfall sources are recharging the system. Is it only the rainfall that's nearby, or maybe it's rainfall up in the mountains that flows down and replenishes the aquifer? So you need assumptions about this. You also then need to know about things like how much are towns are and individuals taking out for drinking water, irrigation, and so on. So you need to know those extraction patterns. Once you've set up the, that basic system of model about what's going on, you have to set up your model that's a complex system of differential equations that require a numerical solution. They're typically quite slow to run, and because of all the assumptions that go in there, they're subject to quite a lot of uncertainty. And they're quite expensive to run because it takes a lot of personnel to go out and do all the measurements and put together all of the information that's needed to do a reliable model. So for this reason, there's been a lot of interest in recent years about exploring more data-driven approaches that use statistical modeling and machine learning ideas. A uh, particularly good paper would recommend is one by Backer and Shahs 2019, and you can get this from the list of references that's in the paper uh, that describes our work, which we'll be putting onto the ASEMS website. So because of the complexities of doing the modeling with these physics-based models, there's been a lot of interest in recent years for using these more data-based approaches. So first of all, I want to give you a disclaimer. Despite the title of our presentation today, we're not going to be able to give you all of the answers. We're not going to tell you, will the water last? Because it's a very complex question. What we will be telling you about today is what are some of the data available for water resource monitoring? And a lot of what we'll be talking about today is an attempt to demystify the machine learning versus the classical statistical strategies for time series modeling, and then show you how they do in modeling some of these bores. And then we'll finish up by talking about some of the challenges and a little bit of discussing about how statistical research ideas can arise from these practical problems. If you're interested in more detail, there's a paper that's going to be appearing shortly in the International Statistical Review, and it will be on the ASEMS website. So if you go to the Water New South Wales website, and I've given you the, the link here, there's an absolutely astonishing amount of information there about uh, the water monitoring network across the whole of New South Wales. There's probably similar things for other states as well, but I'll be talking today about New South Wales. And this uh, very, very rich resource tells you all about rivers and streams, about dams, uh, all various groundwater sites. What we are going to be particularly focusing on is these groundwater sites that have these automatic telemeters attached. And I'll just add here that that picture of the guy over on the, on the side here, standing in the middle of the river, this was Stephanie's job when she first graduated from university as a, um, as a hydrologist. She just saw the light then and decided that she wanted to be a statistician analyzing the data rather than the person standing in the middle of rivers collecting the data. So the monitoring bores are very interesting. Some of the data are available for um, as long as 40 years and there's hundreds of monitoring bores all across New South Wales. In the early days, what would happen is they would have to send out somebody who would uh, go in and manually measure how, how far you had to go down to see uh, how far you'd go to get water. But in more recent years, a lot of them have these automated systems where there's a, a, a continuous monitor in place that's measuring how far, basically you can see on the right hand side here, how far down you have to go before you get to the water table level. 
So that tells you, uh, it gives you an indication of how much change there is in the underlying aquifer. And it tells you about some other things as well, but it's basically reflecting how much water is in there. Modeling the bore water levels is very challenging because it turns out that there's a lot of variability in the pattern. Sometimes this is driven by climate, but also, and increasingly so, I think, it's driven by demand. For example, people extracting water for irrigation, people extracting water for drinking supplies and so on. And then sometimes there's just weird funky patterns where who knows what happened. And we'll see that in a couple of examples. So we are particularly focused on some of these sites where there are lots of data. I'm gonna just show you a couple of them. So here's, here's a, a bore. That's, this graph is taken directly from the New South Wales uh, water site. And this shows a bore up in the Alstonville area up in the Richmond River Basin. So it's up in Northeast New South Wales. It's an area where there's lots of rain. And you can see from this pattern, it's quite variable because this is an area where there's strong annual patterns in the rainfall. But you also see that overall long-term trend is really not there. The bore is fairly stable. It's kind of an up and down uh, pattern. Here's one from the Bigger River where I grew up, not in the river, but in the town. And this is an interesting one because you can see that something must have happened around 2009, 2010, maybe they changed the instrument. Who knows? If you were analyzing this bore, you'd probably want to go and figure out what happened, if anything, at that time. But you can see after that time, again, this is fairly stable. You see some big spikes. And I know from growing up there that bigger would often, the bigger river would often get quite flooded. And those are probably occasions when there was a flood. Here's one from Wilcannia, which is in the Darling River, river Basin. You can see from the map, it's the far west of New South Wales. It's a very dry area. And this is one of the areas where there's a lot of pressure on water supplies. And unfortunately, when you look at this, it's a really disturbing pattern where you just see this gradual, continual decline over time. This one is a bore in the Murray-Darling Basin, getting down towards uh, our colleagues in Melbourne. This is an interesting one because we know that this is an area where there's a lot of agriculture. And what you see here is really, really strong annual patterns which presumably are not driven by, by rain, but would be driven by uh, extractions. So people extracting water during the dry parts of the year for their irrigation and drinking water supplies. So our question, our task then was to try to come up with some models, because what we really like to do is to build a model that captures these patterns and then ideally being able to project into the future under different climate change scenarios or different usage scenarios and so on. So we won't quite get there today, but we will talk, you, talk to you about how some of the modeling goes. So in the case of this Alstonville Plateau slide uh, bore, you can see here from the right hand side, uh, the top turquoise panel is the rainfall, quite spiky, it's quite a, a high rain area. The green in the middle is evapotranspiration, strong annual patterns here, where it basically tells you how quickly rain, uh, once it hits the ground, is going to evaporate away. And then on the bottom, you see the bore levels taken from the telemeters. This particular bore has um, telemeter data since about 2006. So I'm going to tell you about three broad classes of modeling. First of all, we'll talk about the classical statistical approach, time series modeling. Then we'll talk about uh, neural networks and some of their extensions to the time index setting. Then we'll talk about GAM modeling, which is another kind of classical approach, but it's one that happens to be really good for trying to capture some of these nonlinear effects. So first of all, the time series, the classical statistical time series. In Rob Heinemann's book on statistical uh, time series forecasting, he talks about dynamic regression modeling. And the idea here is that you've got a set of outcomes, Y1 up to YT, measured at T different times, and then you've got a set of predictors at each time. Uh, in our case, these are gonna be the rain and climate variables. So the dynamic regression modeling strategy is you express Y as a linear combination of the predictors plus an error term. And in this context, the error term is allowed to have some autocorrelation in there. I'm not gonna have time to go into the technical aside, but if you're interested down over on the right-hand side, it talks a little bit more about 
what's assumed about the structure on that error term. It's an ARIMA structure. So the Fable package in R, Rob's Fable package, allows you to fit that kind of model. Now, this, you might say, oh, it's such a simple model, just uh, linear effects and so on. Well, you can actually generalize it. You can add in interactions and nonlinear effects and make this more general if you want, but we'll come back to that later. So that's the time series approach. The neural network approach, basic idea here is that, again, you've got your outcome at time t, you wanna predict that outcome as a function of your predictors, the blue uh, input uh, nodes here, but the way they do it is quite different. So they construct what's called a hidden layer. So that's the red circles here represent a hidden layer and it will have a number of different nodes. So each of these hidden layer nodes is allowed to be a potentially nonlinear function of some of the covariates or the predictors that are in the input space. It's via the hidden layer and also the activation functions, next slide, it's the activation functions that allow the neural networks to, it, to create that nonlinear effect. And also, because you're creating this intermediate set of hidden nodes, that's where you can start to get the interactions. So some people describe these neural networks as basically a, a, a nice automatic way to generate the rich predictor space that you need to get a, a good fitting model. The multi-layer neural network is basically exactly what you might think. It just adds multiple layers of the, the multiple hidden layers. Sometimes these are called multi-layer perceptrons or often they use the term feed forward network, which makes sense because you start off with your input variables, in our case, our rain variables. You construct a layer of hidden nodes that are functions of those input variables. Then you construct another layer of hidden nodes that are functions of the nodes in the previous layer. So you basically feed the information forward. We'll talk more in a minute about how these complex models are fitted. In the last several decades, there's been a massive amount of work in extending these neural networks to all sorts of contexts. One of those is extending to the time domain. And the idea here is that the prediction at time t depends not only on the predictors at time t, but also what was happening at the previous time point. So in this simple illustration, you can see that the hidden node at time t gets predicted by the input predictors, the xt's, but it also is influenced by the hidden nodes at the previous time point. So it's got some of that flavor of what we see in time series modeling, where you're building in a little bit of a lag structure like that. What we, we have been exploring in the context of our ball modeling is an extension of that again to what's called the LSTM or long short term memory recurrent neural network. And this is a, it's an interesting one that they're complex to understand, but basically what they do is they say, look, Sometimes there might be things from, you know, a few weeks ago or things from a couple of months ago that are important. I don't want to have a model that has to have, you know, too, too many lags in there. So I'll carry along a set of extra memory cells that can be carried along over successive time points and basically keeps track of things that have happened in the past, but which might be important for predicting at my current time point. I'm really way oversimplifying it here, but I think that hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavor. These kind of techniques have been widely and highly successfully used in natural language processing sentiment analysis. And that's a kind of setting where the context is really key so that the, the memory cells help you to keep track of the context, which might be really important for predicting your outcome at time t. So let's go back now to the Alstonville Plateau and let's see how some of these methods uh, compare. So remember what we wanna do is predict the bore water levels from our rain and our evapotranspiration. So what we did was we fitted ARIMA models using the Fable package in R and we, used, we fitted LSTM models using the Keras package in R as well. We did a bit of exploration about how many lags and it turned out for this particular bore we needed about 120 lags, which actually makes sense. And if you think about it, just because it rains today, that rain is not gonna get into the bore today 
it's going to take a while for that rain to get in there. So that's why some of the bores, and it depends on the bore, may need quite a few lags. Now this slide, I'm very happy and excited about this slide. And this is uh, taken from uh, our paper that's about uh, to appear in International Statistical Review. And what this does, it shows in the top panel, the results of fitting the ARIMA model, the time series model. And in the bottom panel, it shows the result of fitting the LSTM model. Just a little bit more detail, the turquoise line, I hope nobody's colorblind, but the turquoise shows the rain, the green shows the evapotranspiration, the blue shows the observed bore levels, which is what we're trying to predict. And believe it or not, the orange shows our prediction from these two models. And I don't know about you, but I think this looks pretty darn good. And what you can see here is neither of the approaches are perfect, but they both do overall a very good job. Uh, you can see that the, whereas the LSTM might do well in one spot, it won't do so well in another spot. When we look at the mean square error, which is the sum of squares of the differences between the observed and the predicted, it was pretty much identical and it was a very good fit. So that was really, really interesting. So now let's start to look under the hood a little bit to try to understand what is it about these models that's uh, giving us these fits. So in both cases, they're trying to construct a data-based model that's gonna predict well in new data settings. That's really what you wanna try to do. But you have to balance model complexity with simplicity and generalizations. So people sometimes talk about the Occam's razor principle in data science where you, you want the model to be as complex as you need to be able to describe what's important. If you make your, comp your model over complex, you'll start to get extra errors coming, coming in from overfitting and so on. But the, there are actually quite interesting philosophical differences. So in statistics, for example, we're trained to seek a parsimonious set of predictors. That's just stats 101. You don't want to overspecify your model. So a lot of times you'll see statisticians, part of our training is that you really engage with your subject matter experts and your collaborators. You look at the literature to identify what are the important predictors and you build those into your model. So it's this blend of trying to think about the subject matter and using this more empirical data-based uh, modeling. But you definitely wanna make sure that your models are well identified with a unique solution. I'll come back to this point later because it's actually quite important. My take on the neural network perspective, and again, this is my take as a statistician, is it's a bit of a different philosophy. The idea there is look, create a really rich set of predictors, over rich, like build in all your interactions, your nonlinearities. So it's actually, you've basically tons of stuff in there, but then you use the computer to try to train the model to figure out what does it need. So you basically give it everything and then rely on the computer to help you figure out what's going on. I'd actually like to turn over to Stephanie at this stage to tell us a little bit more about how it works with training a neural network model. I'm going to um, give a general overview of neural network training and setup and what goes into that. So model training is a process of feeding the data through the model and then updating the model over and over and over again until your model output resembles your measured data. So if we look at the speed forward network that Louise has introduced earlier, the data is fed in in the input layer and each blue circle represents an input data item. And the data then travels through the layers of the network to the output. And as it travels, it gets multiplied by these weights, which are parameters. And they're unique to each pathway that the data can take through the model. Um, at each hidden node, each of the red nodes, the sum weights of the data from the previous layer are run through a nonlinear transformation. And then they're again multiplied by weights and fed on to the next layer and so on until you reach the output. So when we talk about updating the model during training, what we're talking about is adjusting this set of weights or parameters. And we do this by starting with them initialized to very small um, levels near zero. And then we pass a small set of training data through the model and we calculate the error at the output. And you can specify what object, objective function you want 
we use the mean squared error for ours. And then the error gradient is determined for each weight in the model. And finally, the weights are updated um, in the opposite direction of this gradient. So using a step size known as the learning rate. At each iteration, the new value of each weight will be equal to the previous value minus a small step in the direction of the gradient. And these iterations continue until your output matches um, your validation data. And so I've talked about training data and validation data. And what do I mean by that? We'll see here. So it's network training to divide your entire data set up into three portions, training data, validation data, and testing data. And because ours is a time series, we've divided it up sequentially. So we've got the first 60% for training, and then 20% for validation, and 20% for testing. So you can see that upper plot there, where the dark blue is our time series of water level. The light blue is a rainfall. And you can see on the testing set, we've overlaid the orange prediction as well. So while you're doing the training on the training data, you're also monitoring your error on the validation data set. So if you look at the middle plot, this is similar to what Louise showed earlier. The blue line is the error on the training data, which as expected declines as training goes on. And the green line is the error on your validation data. So that starts to decline. And then at some point it starts to increase. And this indicates the point where your model is no longer generalizing well outside of your, your training data set. So this is sort of around the area where you want to stop training to prevent overfitting. And usually it's where those two lines cross. So not only do we divide our data up into these three portions, we also separate it into small amounts of batches, uh, which are subsets of data, which is passed through the model at one time and then an update step occurs after each batch. And when all the batches that make up the whole data set have been through the model one time, this is considered one epoch of training. So if you look at the lower plot, again, our um, observed data is in dark blue. And after we pass the data, the entire data set through one time, one epoch, we see the red dotted line as our prediction, which is pretty much horizontal across the middle. And after the data has been through two times, we've got the red dashed line, which is looking a lot more like the observed data, but not there yet. And after 100 epochs, we get the uh, orange line, which better matches our, our observed data. So I've talked about updating the parameters or weights of the model as training occurs, but neural networks also have hyperparameters. And these are variables that determine the structure of the network, how the network's trained, but they require specification before training begins and they're not updated as training goes along. So for our model, the hyperparameters we looked at were the structure of the network. So how many layers, we looked at one layer or two layer networks, how many nodes on each layer. And then for the training, how many lagged values of the input to include with each observation, the regularization parameter to prevent overfitting, and the patient parameter to signal when to stop. So a method of hyperparameter selection is to basically run the model with lots of combinations of possible hyperparameters and then choose the set that gives you the best results. And this for us involved over 28,000 model runs. So luckily we had Dan on our team who could run these overnight um, on the CSIRO computing cluster. Otherwise, it would have taken me forever on my laptop. And this is a result of over 28,000 model runs. Um, each of the x-axis and the legends in these plots are the hyperparameters that we're looking at. And the y-axis is the mean squared error, so the loss. So lower values on the y-axis indicate better model performance. So starting in the top left, we choose the regularization parameter lambda and the patients. And then with that patients and lambda, we move to the top right and we're looking at how many lagged inputs we want to include. And we see that model performance increases with more lagged inputs. And we've chosen 50 to use in our model. And then in the lower left, we're deciding between one layer and two layer networks. And then with all the hyperparameters we've chosen so far, in the lower right, we narrow it down to how many nodes we want to have in our network. And we've chosen 32. 
So that was a brief overview of what went into training our model, and I will now pass back to Louise to continue with the lecture. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, there we go. So just a, a couple of just brief thoughts about pros and cons. Hopefully you're seeing some of it here. And despite the fact that the, the two approaches actually do a remarkably similar job here in terms of the prediction, but the ARIMA approach has a nice advantage. You can see on the top panel there that these there's little uh, shaded bands around. So these are prediction intervals and it gives you some assessment of how much uncertainty there is in the prediction. The neural network really does a great job of generating this rich set of predictors, interactions, nonlinearities, and so on. And the statistical approach can do this, but it is much more manual. The classical statistical approaches though, don't cope as well if the predictor space is too big, or particularly if there's multicollinearities. The neural network can handle that, but it needs a larger sample sizes. And the cost of that flexibility is that it tends to be a little bit more uncertainty, a little bit more um, variability in the predictions. It right. also... Sorry, Peter, we can... Oh, yeah, uh, it, it tends to uh, need the equally spaced observations. So let's look at a more complicated bore. So this is one, I, I don't want to give you too much detail about exactly which one this is because it's part of ongoing work that we're doing with the Department of Primary Industry and Environment here in New South Wales. But suffice to say that this is a bore in the western part of the state where it's under considerable more pressure. Uh, it's a drier area and it also turns out there's quite a lot of extraction. What you see in the top panel here is where this is the bore levels and you see this quite dramatic change over time. So time zero here is back in the 1970s where it was nice and stable, but over time, you start to see patterns. It looks a bit random, but in fact, if you zero in, what you see is that it starts to get these really strong annual patterns, a little bit like what I showed you before with that Murray Darling bore. It's also an example where you can see that in the earlier days, the measurements were manual, so they had to send some person out to measure by hand, whereas in about the early 2000s, they put the telemeters in and they've got measurements every day. So this is the unequal measurement pattern that made it hard to do the LSTM type models. So the analysis is a lot more complicated, in mostly because of this, the fact that there are these strong temporal trends and also it turns out that the extraction data, which is the panel on the bottom, extraction, if you just eyeball it there, you can, you can see, oh yeah, as soon as they started to do more extractions, you can see that the level started to go down. But how can we capture that? Because the extractions aren't measured on a daily basis, and they're probably not even measured super accurately, but these are just annualized values. So we decided to start exploring the GAM approach. So this is actually one of my favorite techniques and it's funny, I often find myself, I'll like start exploring an approach and then I'll come back to GAM models in the end because they're just a really nice, elegant tool that allows you to build statistical models that naturally can accommodate nonlinear effects. You can also include interactions as well and we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, the kinds of GAM models, we tend to like the function by Simon Wood in the R package. It's a um, MCGB package in R. It's really great. And this is an excellent book that I definitely recommend. You can potentially or theoretically include some autocorrelation in the error as well, but it does tend to slow things down a lot. It degrades the computation. And in my opinion, it's actually not so important for prediction. It's really the, the, the predictors, the rain, those variables that you're feeding in, those are really the important elements. So if you wanted to do a GAM model for the water data, you might do something like this. You might say water levels equal to a smooth function of rainfall plus a smooth function of day within year. That's to help you get those annual dips. A smooth function of time plus error. And here, the, the S's are smooth functions. The default in, in 
Simon Wood's GAM function is that they are splines. And in fact, they, they're basically linear functions of spline basis functions. So let me just say a little bit more about this whole idea of um, trying to fit. The, the, this has got to do with how we can capture that extraction effect. So as I said to you, GAMs can accommodate interactions. So before, I wanted to see how it works. So I generated a little simulation. So I generated some data where there was a really strong cyclical pattern. So I generated some monthly data, but I made the cyclical pattern, I made it so that the amplitude varied randomly by month. So if you look in the panel at the left-hand side here, you can see the black line shows you my true curve, and you can see that some months it's got small amplitude, some months it's got large amp amplitude. I fitted a simple GAM model here, and you can see the fitted curve in red kind of captures it, but it can't capture that change in amplitude. So then I thought, well, let's put in an interaction term. So I put in, in the middle, I did a GAM model where I included an interaction term of my smooth term in, of by day and month, but interactive with month. But here, it's just looking at month as like a linear thing. And you can see that, oh yes, it's allowing the amplitude to change, but it's doing it in a linear fashion. You're seeing it fan out. The last plot, I let it interact with month, but I treated month rather than as a, a continuous variable, just as a factor variable. And you can see here that in this little simulation, it actually does a remarkable job of capturing uh, those patterns. So let's see how it looks in the data. So this is a, another bore. And what I've got over in the right hand side is that summary graphic, which shows you the black at the top is the measured bore levels. You can see that this is also a bore where it, the pattern changes a lot. Back in the 70s, it was fairly stable. More recently, you could start to see those really strong annual patterns. The turquoise tells you about rain. The green tells you about evapotranspiration. We also have another variable in here, river flow, which I don't quite have time to talk about. If people want, we can talk about it later. And on the bottom, we've got the variable that tells us how much was extracted each year. So what we did was we fitted a GAN model to the water level data. We included the lagged rain and lagged evapotranspiration data, just like we did before. But we also now included an overall annual trend effect and we included this interaction with the day within year variable and it interacted with the total amount extracted for the year. And I have to say, I, I actually was surprised at how well this seems to go. It seems to be able to capture that phenomenon where once you move into a period where there's higher levels of extraction, you start to get these uh, stronger annual patterns within each year where you get this dip down, presumably as people are starting to extract uh, more water. I may end up skipping over this. I was going to tell you about how GAMs definitely provide the flexibility, but they can do so with some parsimony. I'll take a two second version to tell you about this. So some of you may, have, may be thinking about what we've talked about so far, and you might have said, look, these are terrible models because you're just putting in, you know, couple, you know, 120 rain lags. That's a really badly defined model. It's got, it's over parameterized. You probably have order um, collinearity in the rain variables. And also you're ignoring the fact that uh, there's a time structure here. So for example, the coefficient from day 10 shouldn't be terribly different from the coefficient from day 11, for example. So it turns out that there is a, a, an approach you can use called the distributed lag model. And Simon Wood's book describes how you can not only smooth the rain effect itself, but you can smooth those coefficients over time into what's called a distributed lag model. So that's actually what we used uh, to fit this model. I think I may skip over this in the interest of time, but we can come back to it if anybody's interested in uh, how the distributed lags work. But it, it's actually, I was pretty excited about that as well. Here's another board. So we applied those same technologies. You can see the patterns here are quite different and there's uh, some funny little patterns in there. But again, you can see 
that it seems to be doing quite a good job of capturing those overall patterns. So a few concluding remarks and where are we now? So like I said to you at the beginning, unfortunately, we're not gonna tell you the full answer because it's really, really hard. I feel like we've made some good progress, we're part of the way along, but we're not quite there yet. What we're really needing to do here is to develop these reliable models that allow you to project into the future. And what you wanna be able to say is what might the future look like under different scenarios? So what if you had several years of really low rainfall data? What if you had, if you really cut back on the amount that was extraction extracted? Or what if the amount of extraction increased? But it's hard. I think you've seen that in a simple situation like the Alstonville one, you can come up with a really, really good model. But in a lot of these situations and in the ones that you actually, where it's really important to do good predictions, it's the human effects, the extractions, the dam releases and so on. Those are the things that are major drivers of what's going on, but they're hard to capture and they're hard to model. I think you'll probably have seen there is no magic bullet analysis. Uh, and we've told you about a few approaches here, but they definitely have some strengths and weaknesses. The ARIMA is appealing because it lets you get that autocorrelation term captured well. But it is hard to, to include all the relative, re relevant predictors in there. And what we tended to find was as we tried to add more predictors in, it would be computationally a bit challenging. The neural network approach is really good at generating that rich predictor space, but it does need a lot of data. And it, uh, particularly the LSTMs, really can't handle the unequally spaced data very well. There are strategies which we're thinking about, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult and none of the approaches are entirely satisfying. And it is computationally very demanding. As Stephanie told you, you can't just fit one of these models. You have to go through this tuning process to make sure you're doing it right. The GAMs do offer some nice flexibility and they do a great job of capturing the temporal trends that you see in the observed data. But it's hard to project those into the future because they're semi-parametric, they're based on splines. So you don't know what's gonna happen in the future. So it's quite hard. Um, Bayesian analyses would be a useful thing to think about as well, but we haven't got to the point of trying this. And then ideally what's really being cried out for here is to do a multi-bore analysis. And that's what we're doing at, at the moment. And there's actually some really interesting work out there of trying to utilize information from multiple different time series to help inform, uh, give a more informative prediction for the time series of interest. It's kind of a borrowing strength idea. The very last slide, next slide. I just wanted to just throw out a couple of philosophical thoughts in closing. So we, we definitely have not provided all the answers. I, I, I'm well aware of that, that we haven't, but I do love this project. I, I sort of feel like it's my statistical sweet spot to use a, a tennis analogy. I'm sure there's some tennis players uh, listening today. I really like this kind of project where you get to use some cutting edge methods that you already know about, something that's in, in your comfort zone, but it's interesting. But I love it when you have to learn about new things, so new statistical methods. And for me, what's been great about this project is learning about these neural networks and how they relate to the more classical statistical approaches. It's always so exciting for us to learn about a new area of science. I really knew nothing about hydrogeology a year ago. And now while I'm far from being an expert, um, it, I feel like I've got a little bit of an understanding and it's really darn interesting. The fact that this is a project where it has an impact in the real world and we, we, we know that water is important and planning for the future is important. So it's very satisfying to feel that you can do a project where your work has a potential to make a difference. And then of course, it's always very nice if you have a project where you're actually funded to do it. We do have a bit of funding from DPIE, but I have to say, if it wasn't for ASEMS, we could not do this because this kind of work takes a lot of time. You really have to invest in trying to understand the underlying uh, subject matter science. It just takes a lot of time. So if it wasn't for ASEMS,
we wouldn't be able to have delved into it in the, in the depth that we had. So that's really great. I, I really think that projects along these kinds of lines are really great and really great for the, for the mathematical sciences in Australia to really try to embrace. And we need more projects like this. It helps our students and postdocs. It helps our public image as well, I think. And it, if we could tell these kinds of stories to uh, young high school or um, people in early university, it can help attract new people to our field. So thanks very much, Louise. It was incredibly interesting and also Stephanie. Um, we do have quite a lot of questions on the Q&A. Um, okay. I think you can see them. Um, just going back right to the start, um, Tim asked, this thing about Australia being the second driest continent, are we talking about groundwater, surface water, rainfall, or, or what do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I just went to the, I went to the Geosciences Australia site and um, uh, I believe it's got to do with rainfall, but I have, have to admit, I haven't read that in gory detail. So um, it's a good question, but go to Geosciences Australia site where they talk about that. I was surprised actually. I didn't think that Antarctica would be considered as a dry, as a, as a dry um, uh, continent. Well, that's because the water's all frozen, I believe. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a couple of technical ones about various things to do with the neural network. So one is the, um, from Annie, do the memory nodes contain the same variables in each, each iteration? Or do, do they contain different subsets of information at different times? Um, the memory nodes, my understanding, and I have to admit, I don't have as deep an understanding on this as I would like. My understanding is that the bandage of these memory nodes is that things can drop in and out. So it's got, it's got, um, it's got mechanisms to uh, keep hold of things that they think might, that thinks might be important and to let go of things that are no longer important. So things can pop in and out of the memory nodes. Got a bit more of a basic question from Colin, going back to the very start actually. Why do you want to predict groundwater levels? If it's in the value of its, if, it's the value in extraction that's one thing, but if it's about sustainable ecology at the surface groundwater interface, it's another. Yeah, but that's a good question. And I don't think the interest is solely in the groundwater levels, but where I first got involved in some of this was, it, it was, and it's something I think I can talk about because it's on the New South Wales Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, where there was a question about whether a company could come in and start water mining. This was in uh, Northeast New South Wales. So there was a company that was wanting to get a license to extract water for bottling for profit. And because it was Northern New South Wales, you can imagine it became very controversial very quickly. And so we got involved because the question was, if, this, if there were, um, what do the aquifers look like? If, the, if water were extracted for the purposes of uh, water bottling industry, would that start to deplete the aquifers? So this question of how stable are they? Are they declining over time? Are they sensitive to the amount of extractions? It's that kind of question. But I think it's absolutely true that you're interested in the whole water ecosystem. The aquifers are absolutely key part of it. I know there, are, I was in um, Alice Springs last year, we went out there for a cycling holiday and I looked at the very dry river and I said, where do they get their water? And it turns out that the water comes from underground aquifers. And I asked, you know, how sustainable? And they're like, oh, it's, it's infinite, you know, we're never gonna run out of water. Well, how do you know? You know, what do the patterns look like? How do we know that you're never gonna run out of water? If you can't do some modeling and look at those trends over time, it's very dangerous to just keep extracting you need to understand what that process is. Because it is, the, the surface water is also incredibly important, but that's not been part of what we've looked at. Okay, Louise, we've, got, we've only got time for a couple more, so I'll just try and be quick. One from John, what about the issue of spatial data? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So if we were infinitely clever and had infinite time and infinite computer resources, you might really want to do a big gigantic spatio-temporal model. That would be like the, that would be the, the great thing to do. But computationally, it would be very, very hard. We, we will think about those um, in the next step as part of the multi-bore analysis, but spatial temporal modeling is difficult at the best of times. They're quite complex models. And here we have very complex data. Those things I didn't tell you about. So for example, 
what we've done is when we're predicting at a, in, at a particular bore, what we do is we look at the rainfall gauge that's nearest that bore, just making the assumption that that's the right one to use. We look at the extraction bore nearest the monitoring bore. But in fact, there's rainfall gauges all over the place. So what you would really want to do is think about a model that puts all of that in there together, but you're going to have um, a really, really complicated setting. And we have not yet explored that, but it's a natural question to ask. It would be a great thing to do. Okay. Um, there's a, still plenty of questions, but I'm just going to ask two more, which have jumped okay. out at me. First from Melanie. Uh, Melanie's interested in the potential to feed these models into decision support systems for extraction and dam management. So the second, I guess, you know, you're modeling and then what do you do with what you learn? Yeah, I think that that's a really good, that's a really good question. I think that my feeling is that these decisions about uh, extraction licenses and so on, they're quite complex. I would certainly think that this kind of tool, the modeling tool, would be a, could be a critical piece of information to inform the decision making. But I don't think it would ever be just like an automatic uh, decision based on the modeling. But I think that if you can do an analysis and you can say, look, in this particular river basin, it's probably close to being over extracted. You probably don't want to release more or you don't want to give more licenses. It'd be that kind of tool. And that, that's why something like this, I think, is really important and would be useful. And uh, hopefully we'll end up coming up with some tools that the department um, will be interested in. Okay, and finally, Louise, there's a question. I think that you're gonna like this question. Um, so Noah would love to know if you got any advice for early undergraduate students interested in water science. Oh. Um, do you have any elaboration on what some of the real world and community implications of this research could be? Well, you've sort of answered I've, a bit the second yeah, one. I've, the yeah, I've sort of answered that. I mean, I think that uh, depending, on, depending on how you're funded, but if, if somebody, for example, were a PhD student or a postdoc and with the luxury of being able to identify a topic of interest, the amount of data available is mind boggling. So for example, if you had a talented stats student who wanted to do research on spatiotemporal modeling for their PhD, you could go in and grab some of this data and develop some models that could potentially be really useful. Now, how to get that to a setting where people actually start to use it, that's a harder question, but that's where something like ASEMS, I really feel that uh, an organization like ASEMS can play a really critical role in bridging that, you know, the people out there, the students, the postdocs, bridging that work to the decision makers and government agencies who might potentially use it. Um, CSIRO is doing some fantastic work in this sort of area as well. And, but yeah, it's hard to do it in complete isolation. What you ideally want to do is to be part of a team where you've got, you're collaborating with your water science specialists who can help frame the questions. I think that if you just do it as an abstract statistical or mathematical uh, framing of the question, you can be a little bit too theoretical. You want to make sure your work is really grounded in real world uh, impact, in, in my opinion. So finding uh, a team that you can be part of, maybe volunteer, if, you, if you're funded, if your funding allows you to do that. So, yeah. So, thanks very much, Louise. Um, there's still plenty of other questions and comments, but I'm afraid we've already gone over time. So I'll have to bring it to draw it to a close there. So thanks everyone for your attendance. I hope you did get something out of it. Um, if you want to recommend it to any colleagues who haven't been able to be here today, it will be on the website. And if you want to get in touch with Louise and Stephanie about any aspect of it, I'm sure they'll be very keen to hear from you. So thanks very much, Louise. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Peter. <laughs>